Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about our work on a uh, GPU accelerated high throughput solver for the marginalized graph kernel. So this talk will be uh, divided into two parts. And the first part will um, first uh, give a background introduction on what is a marginalized graph kernel and uh, why it is useful for machine learning on graphs. In the second part, we're going to introduce uh, what we did to accelerate the computation of the solver on the GPUs. So, um, so right now, um, within the DOE, there's a strong trend of applying machine learning and artificial intelligence to uh, enhance our uh, capability in carrying out scientific research. And to this end, we've had a few success stories. For example, we can now use machine learning to automate the extraction of information from uh, existing scientific literature. We can also use machine learning to detect patterns from climate simulation or to infer the velocity field from a visualization of the flow of the fluid. But these are all um, machine learning results that are carried out on um, a regular grid or mesh or a sequence. Well, in the real world, uh, many scientific data that we're interested in are actually um, data that cannot fit into that form. These are data that are actually have maybe um, uh, a greatly, uh, a largely varying size, or the data might actually have a non-sequential relationship, or they have, might have a mixture of continuous and discrete degrees of freedoms. So, mm, the um, existing approach for dealing with those kind of data in machine learning is to first uh, use a fingerprint algorithm to convert those data into uh, feature vectors or to or maybe to convert those data into an image and then feed those into a, the existing machine learning pipeline but um, another way of dealing with that which is also potentially a much more powerful way of doing that as to use a graph to encode such information. So here we, uh, a graph is a discrete structure that contains, consists of nodes and edges. And the nodes are um, the, uh, the nodes are the uh, atomic individual elements of the graph where the edges connect uh, pairs of graphs. And both, uh, both uh, the edges can be directed or undirected where both the nodes and edges could have attributes. And of course, the thing is, how do we then apply our machine learning algorithm to this kind of data structure? That's an um, interesting question here. So here, um, one of the way of the hacking that uh, that we resort to is to use uh, kernel methods. So kernel is essentially um, a function that can take in a pair of objects and then output a inner product of that object in some high dimensional space. You can think of that output as a similarity score between the two objects. And the kernel can now, and, and that's the good thing about kernel is that it encapsulates uh, any knowledge that we have about the data and just uh, output a single similarity score. And that score can be used then uh, by any machine learning algorithm to carry out the prediction. Well, the algorithm themselves don't have to um, uh, maintain um, uh, um, to, to keep that knowledge of the original data. So many machine learning algorithms that are in use today uh, actually have a kernelized uh, counterpart. For example, we can uh, the the support vector machine could either be derived using explicit feature vectors or uh, be represented in a um, kernel space um, equivalence. And the same thing also applies to things like rate regression, principal component analysis, different kinds of clustering algorithms, or uh, random projection or random featureization schemes. So here, uh, in the uh, a kernel, and uh, then we can also apply kernels to graphs. And here, basically, the idea is that the kernel should take in two graphs and then output um, define somehow an inner product between the two graphs in some abstract feature space. And to this end, the people, uh, there are many different uh, existing 
uh, graph kernels that have been proposed in history. And the one that we are particularly interested in is this marginalized graph kernel. Mm. So what it does is it defines the similarity between the graph as a statistical average of the similarity of random walk path that we can generate on the graph. So to actually do this computation and to de define the similarity, what we first need to do is we need to define a random walk process on the graphs. This can normally be induced using the weights of the edges in this graph. And then what we do is uh, once we have the random walk process, we can start sampling the random walk path that we can generate on the graph and store them as a library and compare them. And the way that the sequences, the random walk path are compared is carried out in a node by node and edge by edge manner means that we're gonna first compare the first pair of nodes that, um, that the random walker run into, uh, into random walk path. And then that, um, that similarity or inner product is then multiplied with the uh, first edge that, that the random walk run into. And then that is further multiplied by the second then third nodes, pairs of nodes and edges that that the random walk uh, walker encounters in the end so this allows us to um, decompose the the definition for the similarity between random walk paths into the definition of this uh, individual similarities between nodes and edges and these are called base kernels and eventually the marginalized graph kernel basically provides a way to uh, combine the our computation of the base kernels on the individual nodes and edges um, using the random walk process as defined on the graph. So that said, the explicit formulation for uh, computing this marginalized graph kernel uh, looks like this equation that's shown here, which um, looks a bit of overwhelming. And of course, directly evaluating this infinite summation is gonna take forever. It's also not, uh, it's also very difficult if we want to derive an analytic formula of the derivative of this uh, kernel with regard to the hyperparameters of the base kernel. Well, but the, uh, with, well, well, the derivative is very important if we want to carry out efficient training. So that's why we have, uh, we're able to luckily to carry out some transformation of the original problem by casting those into a linear algebra form. So that in the end, instead of uh, uh, carrying out explicit sampling of the random walk path, we can actually solve an equivalent linear algebra system and the solution of this, of this linear system directly gives us the result of this infinite summation. So this is uh, eventually the linear algebra system that we form, and that, as you can see, it is essentially a um, generalization of the graph Laplacian, mm, so that the system is symmetric and a positive, semi-positive definite, so that we can uh, easily solve that with a iterative solver, linear solver such as conjugate gradient. And also, this linear algebra form is also uh, very friendly uh, for uh, differentiation so that we can basically write out the derivative of the kernel with respect to the hyperparameters using matrix calculus. So this, uh, this kernel so far has found some uh, really successful and, and interest, interesting applications. For example, we have been able to uh, use uh, a graph representation to encode molecules where each node, uh, where each graph represents a molecule and within each graph a node represents an atom while an edge represents uh, a bound. And the graph kernel allows us to define very accurate models that can predict the atomization energy of the molecules. And, and also we have been also been using this kernel to, for example, to detect outliers uh, from certain chemical experiments, such as uh, the one involved, uh, such as the retention time output from a chromatography uh, experiment. Uh, 
We're also trying to use the kernel, uh, for example, to predict uh, functions of proteins and this interaction with drug molecules. So that's that. Given all, this, all the usefulness of this kernel, we're looking for how we can efficiently carry out this computation so that people can train models faster. So the nice thing is that, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, this kernel, the linear system that um, we use to, to compute this kernel can be um, solved using iterative power. So here, basically, we will be iterative, uh, re repeatedly trying to seek the inner product of a linear system as defined by the structure of a graph, mm. and then compute its inner product with certain right-hand side vectors. Um, but there is a catch here. So that is, this linear system is defined on a tensor product of two graphs. It means that uh, if we have two mm, graphs, each with just 16 nodes, then we end up solving a linear system that is 256 by 256. And if we have to graph each with a thousand nodes, and then we end up solving a linear system that has the size of one million by one million. So as you can see here, the uh, cost to solve this system grows very quickly, especially um, in terms, both in terms of the number of flops that has to be consumed and also the amount of memory that we have to use to just, just for the sake of storing this linear system. And we did uh, some preliminary analysis using the roof line model shows that if we are actually going to store this linear system in memory, then we will not be able to get a uh, arithmetic in intensity uh, high enough for us to actually saturate the GPU. When well, actually uh, we're, look, uh, we're probably looking at a measurable like three percent utilization of the peak performance of the GPU if we do it uh, by storing the linear system. So that is why um, we have to uh, innovate here. So the way that we deal with that is by again taking advantage of the mm, uh, of the structure of this linear system by not storing the system, but rather just storing the two smaller graphs that eventually gave up, gave rise, that eventually gave rise to this um, linear system. And then during the iterative solving process, we're going to recompute and uh, regenerate and recompute this uh, linear system on the fly. So we end up, um, by doing this, we end, end up uh, doing a uh, uh, a little more computation because then we have to um, uh, use a kernel, use the edge and node kernels to, um, which cost quite a few flops to regenerate the elements of this confident uh, matrix. But the good thing is that now we only have to load um, each of the smaller graphs by a couple of times instead of the bigger matrix. Mm. And, and the way we do that is to divide this, uh, this each individual graph into uh, smaller pieces called tiles. So here in our specific uh, solver, we set the tile size to be eight. And then uh, we're going to have a double loop where we're going to loop over um, tiles from each of the graph and then uh, for, uh, combine them to form 16, uh, 64 by 64 sub matrices of the big chronicle product system and then multiply them on the fly with the right hand side vector and then store the result into the output vector. Well the um, well the big matrix is never explicitly stored into the global memory. So by doing this we're able to uh, significantly speed up the matrix vector multiplication process. As you can see here the um, if we're going to be storing the matrix in explicit form, we're going to spend uh, probably an order of magnitude more time than if we were actually doing this computation on the fly. So in addition to that, um, we also take advantage of the fact that most of the graphs that we use in the uh, real world applications are actually sparse. So that we don't actually have to store or compute the, the zero elements of the matrix. So here we use a two-level um, 
two level formats to store the graphs. So in the first level, we discard any eight by eight tiles that is completely empty. And then within each of the non-empty tiles, we store only the non-zero elements plus a bit vector that uh, contains the uh, sparsity pattern of the tile. But of course, mm, and, uh, mm, this, uh, and, and this condensed representation of the tile can be packed and unpacked very efficiently on the GPU. And of course, to uh, maximize the performance um, of the solver when using this sparse format, we have to basically dynamically choose between uh, different code paths when we're dealing with tiles of different sparsity. And then in addition to that, we also try to use a graph rewardering algorithm to uh, minimize the number of tiles that are, that are occupied. So basically we're trying to condense the, but we're trying to reorder the graph for its corresponding matrix by, um, by condensing those non-zero elements into as few number of tiles as possible. And to this end, we have tried a, uh, a bunch of different algorithms. And turns out uh, uh, the, this uh, partition-based reordering algorithm, which basically try to minimize the connections um, in the, mm, uh, try to minimize the, con uh, the connections between, uh, across tiles, uh, using hyper uh, using hypergraph partition works the best. So by putting things together, we got a um, GPU solver that is really fast. So we compare this to um, to the existing solvers out there that which are considered the state of the art. So one is called graph kernel. Uh, one is called the uh, the graph kernels, which uh, is written in C++ but have a Python front end. The other one is called Graco, which is written in um, in a in Python, which is an accelerated version of Python. And surprisingly, well, our solver is actually able to get uh, almost four orders of magnitude speed up compared to those existing libraries when tested on uh, some real realistic uh, data sets that involve small drug molecules or protein crystal structures. And going back to that uh, accommodation energy. Uh, problem, we uh, apply this um, um, graph kernel and we and to compute the energy of the molecules and we're actually able to beat uh, all the existing um, uh, methods out there on the status set of QM7 of 7,000 small molecules. So as a summary, uh, we have um, proposed that graphs can be very efficient uh, data structures for uh, representing um, some data that we encounter in scientific modeling, such as uh, such as computational chemistry and materials. And the marginalized graph kernel provides a bridge between this kind of graph data and uh, um, and machine learning methods. And we developed a very fast GPU solver so that people can use the marginalized graph kernel to uh, train machine learning models within a matter of minutes. So that's all of my presentation. I'm ready for questions.